just a few more. Let's uh, think of this one. We have an ether that we want to make. We have an ether. How do we make an ether? Well, we uh, do a, a we could do a Williamson ether synthesis. So we could disconnect here, or we could disconnect here. You know, I'm wondering we could make maybe yeah we can do this probably. <laughs> we could disconnect in either direction, and because these are both primary, they will both work. <clears throat> so this is a, a reasonable possibility in, in either direction. Okay, we can uh, let, um, we can maybe look at both syntheses. Either we have uh, this is our alkyl halide and this is our alkoxide. Or this is our alkoxide and this is our alkyl halide. Both of those would be totally reasonable syntheses because they're both primary and they would both give good yields of the Williamson ether synthesis. So uh, we either want to put an oxygen at this end carbon or a bromine at this end carbon, but both of these are going to be anti-Markovnikov once again. So we could either do that with the bromine by doing HBr and peroxides. And then we can treat this with uh, sodium ethoxide to do our SN2. So that would be a, a simple way to do it. Or we could do anti-Markovnikov addition just like we did before. Uh, of water with hydroboration oxidation, BH3THF, H2O2, and base. That's anti Markovnikov. And then to go to the ether, we have to take our alcohol, we have to convert it to an alkoxide. And so that means step one, we're going to use NaH to make the alkoxide. And then step two, we can put in our uh, alcohol halide, ethyl bromide. Very good. Okay, and uh, let's look at one more example here. We have uh, uh, another transformation. Looks like we have an alkyl halide. We just talked about some of the options that we have for for making put a halogen in the structure. We could start with an alkane. We could start with an alkene. We could start with an alcohol. Okay, but here when we look at our starting material, we say that we're starting with an epoxide. And when we so we already have an oxygen in the structure. So I think this is going to be one of the examples where uh, our simplest synthesis is going to be where that alkyl halide came from having a, an OH in our um, structure initially, and then we convert it to a BR. Okay, so now we have this alcohol we need to make. We're starting with an epoxide. There were two carbons in the epoxide. These are the two carbons that are still here, so this phenyl group clearly wasn't there in the starting material. We have to come back and add in that phenyl. So one of these groups was my nucleophile, one of these groups is my electrophile. In order for them to come together, let's think about the carbon as it was in an epoxide. What kind of reactivity do we have for an epoxide carbon? This is partially positive, so it is an electrophile. So what we need is a phenyl. This, so this carbon was my electrophile as the epoxide. And what we need here is for the phenyl to be a nucleophile, how do we make a phenyl group nucleophilic? It's like if I had a phenyl minus, for example, that would be good. That would be a good way to open up the epoxide. How do we get a phenyl minus? We use or get a metallic reagent like phenyl magnesium bromide or phenyl lithium. Those both work great, a granier or organic lithium. And that's how we're going to form this new carbon carbon bond. So let's do our synthesis then. We're, we've already started at the epoxide, so now we'll add in phenyl magnesium bromide. Okay, that can't be our complete reaction though, because our phenyl minus would open up the epoxide ring. So we have phenyl minus opening up the epoxide ring. That would form this bond, but it would give an O minus here. So every time we use a Grignard, it's always a two step process. Step one is the Grignard or the organolithium, and then step two is H3O plus. You always need this aqueous workup to um, protonate the O minus that you form in that first step. Okay, that's going to give us uh, an OH and a phenyl. So my phenyl is added to one carbon and the OH ends up on the next carbon over. And then how do I go from 
the OH to the bromide, I use something like PBr3 to do a substitution. So in each case for our transformations, uh, sometimes you see it right away and you can, and you can move forward and, and do your transformation, your multi-step synthesis with no problem. But, but by and large, the best approach you're going to have is going to be uh, looking carefully at your product, identifying the functional groups in that product, and recalling what reactions you've seen that will give that functional group as a final, as a final result. And so in doing that retrosynthesis and working backwards a little, you can bridge that gap and find out how you can work forwards to this common structure and, and go forward from there. Okay, but a good synthesis is really about planning and so that's why this retrosynthetic technique is going to be something that really pays off down the line.